Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> I, feel, I feel very welcome now. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's 8.45, so we're kicking off. Um, welcome to the AI Summit 2023. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people here, and I'm sure we're going to have people continuing to come in over the next few minutes. Um, welcome back if you were here with us last year. Uh, I'm sure you have very high expectations for the event today and tomorrow. Um, and if this is your first AI Summit, it's great to have you on the team. Welcome especially to you. My name is Tim Ensor, and I'm going to be your host today as we try and catch up on the somewhat dizzying developments, I would say, in AI in the course of the last year. Um, uh, I'm one of the team at Cambridge Consultants, and so I have the huge privilege of working with our amazingly talented engineers, designers, physicists, mathematicians, and consultants as they help our clients to make the right technology innovation bets and then to deliver those into sustainable business value generation. Now, over today and tomorrow, we have gathered an amazing lineup of speakers for you all um, who are going to update us on the latest developments in AI and share their insights in what that means for AI technology, for the benefits for society, uh, and possibly for the guardrails that we may all need to ensure safety. Now, as you may know, uh, the AI Summit is part of London Tech Week. We're one of the core events for London Tech Week, which is a celebration of tech happening all over the city. And it's in its 10th year this year and has grown amazingly. So this week, we're expecting 30,000 participants, 350 speakers across the five days, um, and maybe many of you, like me, were at the QE2 earlier in the week um, or one of the other fringe events uh, where we've had amazing participation from uh, the government kicked off by the Prime Minister and many other speakers. And this is our mission for London Tech Week. We're here to shape the future. And we're going to do that by uniting global tech right here in the UK to drive sustainable innovation. And I think this phrase, sustainable innovation, is really interesting because it clearly has two important meanings. Firstly, it's about us uniting technology and the talent in all of our teams to try and achieve the UN SDGs, you know, a focus on delivering sustainability. But clearly it also has the meaning about thinking about how do we innovate in a sustainable way. And I think for us this year at the AI Summit, I think this is probably equally important for us to consider. Now for me, I have to say, I think the last 12 months in AI have probably been the most remarkable yet. Um, and it won't surprise you probably that I have to start by talking about ChatGPT. Um, I suspect there won't be a speaker who doesn't mention it um, today. Um, now, it's probably unavoidable that in the run-up to preparing for this, one of my colleagues helpfully gave me some prompts and said, well, this is what ChatGPT says you should talk about. Um, now, ChatGPT, I don't know, it's incredible. ChatGPT was only launched in November. That's seven months ago. Uh, and according to OpenAI, it achieved its first million users in five days. And it now has 100 million users and receives a billion visits a month. A billion visits a month for users of ChatGPT. Now, I suspect, given uh, that we're a relatively AI-focused audience, we've probably all had a go. Um, and if you're anything like me, you'll recognize that it is amazing, the output that it manages to produce. But in some ways, it is slightly disconnected from the people and the context. I'm sure we'll hear more about improvements in the rest of the, the, rest of the day. But it's a little disconnect from people and context. And so when I looked at its recommendations for me, it included this wonderful phrase, um, with great power comes great responsibility. And whilst that's true, uh, and whilst it has its foundations in amazing political and philosophical thinking, I can never say it with a straight face after Spider-Man. Uh, so we move on. The other thing I wanted to highlight was this amazing work in April, which you may have seen which is another source of generative AI, where Boris Elgadson won one of the Sony World Photography competitions with his composition, The Electrician, which is the image on the left here. And Boris very kindly allowed me to use his images uh, for the presentation today. Now, they're part of an amazing and evocative collection called Pseudomnesia, which is, which is fake, imagery, uh, fake memories. Excuse me. Uh, and Boris creates these using the same kind of generative AI techniques that we were talking about at the AI Summit last year. And in comparing his work with photography, Boris likes to use the term promptography because he says he uses prompts into AI in the same way as light enters a camera 
to, to create the artwork. And clearly, these two examples are just a few of the incredible developments in AI over the past year, which have really raised the public consciousness and awareness of AI, and I think, in some degree, the public unease about AI. And clearly, that then led to events just last month where this man, um, Jeffrey Hinton, was one of many uh, to start expressing his concerns over the future of AI. And for many of you probably know, Jeffrey is considered one of the godfathers of AI because of his early work in developing the techniques which really ushered in the current era of deep learning. And his comments were followed fairly shortly after by the open letter of 350 very eminent people you've probably seen, um, where they were advising governments globally to take seriously the risks which may be inherent in the development of future AI. And so I think for this summit, for us this year, I want to put in front of us that I think there's one key challenge and a key question I would love us to all grapple with over the course of today and tomorrow, which is how do we make responsible progress? How do we balance governance and scrutiny and, uh, and policy regulation with the need for innovation and creativity and value generation? And I think as a summit, as we're gathering here today, this is the question I would love us to spend some time focusing on. So let's look a little bit at each side. So first of all, responsibility. As many of you will know, and we will hear from many speakers over the course of these two days, a huge amount of work is going on thinking about the regulation and the policy around AI, and not least so in the UK. So the UK uh, in March, and we'll hear more about this uh, later today, the UK in March published its white paper on AI regulation. And one of the things I love about this, it is unashamedly pro-innovation. It publishes a sector of fra a framework which covers cross-sector principles for any application. And its main ambition is to ensure that we maintain public trust in the development of AI. Now, it is, I would say, at the light touch end of the regulatory options. And if we think about other jurisdictions, there is the EU AI Act, which I would say is probably slightly heavier weight. Um, and I believe it's being voted on in Brussels this week. Um, uh, uh, today, yeah, Ben says today, thank you. Um, and uh, and also then the US are developing their own AI Bill of Rights. Um, uh, whatever your views are on the white paper, it is open to consultation until next week, 21st. And I think it is important that the broadest set of stakeholders contribute. So if you haven't looked at it yet and, 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 and submitted your, your views, please do. Now, underneath the regulatory framework, of course, I think many of us in the room will be involved in what I would refer more tangible AI assurance uh, uh, methods for specific industries and applications. And I think this, for most of us, will be our key challenge in addition to responding to, to regulation. A and this is going to be needed for each of the specific applications that we all work in. And clearly things like finance and medical and aerospace and automotive, the areas where there are the biggest impacts will require considerable fo focus and work. But I also want to encourage all of us as we're working in these areas, let's, let's promote each other's work and success, because that is going to be another key element to driving and maintaining public trust in what we're doing. Now, here in the UK, um, there's some really interesting work that the FCA, Financial Conduct Authority, are doing, exploring regulatory sandboxes, where they're offering people with innovative propositions into finance to work closely with the regulator to get those into the hands of real consumers um, and see how they work. The other one I wanted to highlight to you is some work being done in the US by the FDA. The FDA are the regulator of medical devices, so clearly one of those high-risk areas. And their challenge is, how do we take advantage of the fact that AI, when you put it into the field, can improve its performance? It can learn from new data and generate better patient outcomes. But then it's kind of uncontrolled, so how we deal with that? They've just published a framework, which I think is really nice, and it includes a concept of a predetermined change control plan, um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it has some three really nice components underneath it. So at the point a manufacturer submits its design to, uh, for approval, you have to include a description of the modifications in advance, which says what is the boundaries and the constraints that the AI will have to operate within. It can't change the performance of the device outside these bounds. A modification protocol, which means in advance I have to be able to describe what data am I going to use to retrain, what test approaches am I going to use? And what is my general philosophy for making these updates? And lastly, you have to include an impact assessment. So clearly, the risks and benefits of allowing the AI to make these changes. And I think it's just a really nice example of how organizations are thinking about making these, these issues tangible 
as we think about delivering AI safely in some of these big applications. So that was just a few, and honestly, insu insufficient comments on responsibility. We'll hear more later. Let's talk about progress for a second. It's London Tech Week, so I'm pretty confident that all of you, like me, have a belief in the power of technology innovation to drive new capabilities and new value in our organizations. You know, we believe tech innovation can help our teams to do more and to serve our customers better, be they consumers or clients or patients, our armed services or the general public. Um, and one of the one of the simplest and easiest uh, measures of value clearly is financial. So I'm just going to do some really basic uh, numbers. So if we look back over the last 30 years, technology has been an incredible driver of value creation. Just taking the NASDAQ, which is you know, the US uh, main stock index, it's outperformed massively the other uh, indices um, as a measure of uh, accrual of value from technology. But clearly that's an index, you know, and organizations go up and down and some organizations join and some organizations leave. So if we just zoom in one notch and pick one of them, uh, oh, go on, there we go, Microsoft, Glenn, is the most heavily weighted uh, organization in the NASDAQ. And over the last 30 years, the value creation has been astronomical, 330,000%. Um, and the other stock indices just shrink to nothing um, in comparison. And you might say, well, that's great, but Microsoft is a big company and you know, they've got a lot of people and they do lots of different things. So if we just zoom in one more notch, so Microsoft has, give or take, 200,000 people and a valuation of 2.5 trillion. So that's about $11 million per person. Uh, OpenAI only has 400 people and uh, with a valuation recently at 28 billion, that's 70 million dollars per person over eight years. And so just the ability for technology done well to generate value is astronomical. And you might say, well, Tim, you're just picking the most eye-catching example of the moment, uh, which is true, I have. Um, but the general point is that there is the opportunity for immense progress and value creation through technology. Now, the other thing I'll say is, uh, and this is slightly controversial, we're not all in tech giants and startups, but I want to make an assertion for us all that, in general, it is the owners of technology more so than the users who capture the value. And you to excuse me for a, a very brief um, refresher on economics. So if you're a user of technology, you'll make a small investment, you'll access um, someone else's tools, you'll bring them into your organization, and you'll benefit from efficiency or productivity gains. And this is brilliant because it is the mechanism by which innovation reaches all of our society. It's the way in which innovation gets into our schools and hospitals and our businesses. But I'd still say that it's the owner of that technology who captures most of the value. That will usually involve uh, greater investment and a longer payback time. And some of those innovations will be uh, unprotected. You know, uh, they can be copied. There's no moat, as people like to say at the moment. Um, and when competition enters, then obviously the returns are depressed. But the biggest value creators are looking for those areas where they can apply defendable innovation, where they can identify a, a spot for their organization where it may take more investment, it may have longer payback, but the gains and the value is potentially uncapped. And the reason I want to encourage us all to think about this is because this is available to everybody. You know, this is the kind of work which Cambridge Consultants does with our clients. You know, we help them choose the right technology bets and then we help them to deliver them into the value uh, in the market. Because if it was that easy, everyone would be doing it, right? Um, picking the right bets is hard, and not all organizations have the confidence to, uh, to deliver, the capability to deliver confidently into the market. But there is a huge opportunity for the industry and for society in making progress in AI. And when we're thinking about the regulatory challenges, let us keep this in view. And so I come back to the, ch the question I want us all to consider over the next two days. Is this balance? Responsible progress, how do we get that right? Or indeed, is it a balance? Do we actually need the combination of responsible approaches in order for us to make progress? Big questions. I have to say, I'm thrilled, though, that we have an amazing lineup of speakers to help us think this through. From government, who are going to be setting the policy frameworks, from the big tech companies who are providing those core and incredible platforms for us to build upon. From the application owners who are taking those into market and actually creating amazing things with them. And from a whole range of enablers who will allow all of that to happen smoothly. So I want to leave you with just a few comments about over the course of the next two days as we're away from the office. Let's share insights together as a community. 
let's think about how we're going to make responsible progress together. Uh, in particular, how are we are engaging with the emerging regulatory frameworks? Let's talk to each other about the work we're doing on specific AI assurances for our sectors and our applications. And let's share learnings about where and how we choose to place those big technology innovation bets and then to deliver those into the market.